This is Space Time Series 25, Episode 29. Coming up on Space Time. Discovery of a black hole spinning on its side. The James Webb Space Telescope reaches another milestone. And new science experiments reach the International Space Station. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered a black hole in a binary system which appears to be spinning on its side. The discovery, reported in the journal Science, challenges current theoretical models on black hole formation. The study's authors found the axis of rotation of the black hole, which is known as Max EJ 1820-070, is tilted more than 40 degrees relative to the axis of its stellar orbit with its binary companion. Usually, celestial bodies orbiting around a larger central body are aligned to the central body's rotation. And we can see this is true in our own solar system, where the planets orbit around the Sun along a plane called the ecliptic, which roughly coincides with the equatorial plane of the Sun. And their orbit follows the Sun's spin, travelling in the same direction. And they also all rotate in the same direction as the Sun's rotation as well, with the exception of Venus and Uranus, possibly due to massive collisions early in their history. Observations show the black hole in Max EJ 1820-070 is dragging matter from a nearby lighter companion star orbiting around it. The study's lead author, Juri Patanen from Finland's University of Turku, says the team can clearly see bright optical and X-ray radiation as the last sign of the infalling material to the black hole. And they can also see radio emissions from relativistic jets expelled from the system perpendicular to the black hole's accretion disk. By following these jets, the authors were able to accurately determine the direction of the rotation of the black hole. As the amount of gas falling from the companion star to the black hole began to decrease, the system dimmed and more of the light of the system wound up coming from the companion star. In this way, the authors were able to measure the orbital inclination of the pair using spectroscopy. The difference of more than 40 degrees between the orbital axis and the black hole's spin was completely unexpected. Scientists have often assumed this difference to be very small when they've modelled the behaviour of matter in curved space-time around a black hole. The thing is, current models are already really complex, and now these new findings will force astronomers to add yet another new dimension to them. This is space-time. Still to come, the James Webb Space Telescope reaches another milestone, and a whole bunch of new science experiments reach the International Space Station. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Scientists undertaking the laborious task of fine-tuning the James Webb Space Telescope have reached another critical milestone. The telescope is now in its final orbital position, some 1.5 million kilometres from Earth in the L2 or Lagrangian 2 position on the opposite side of the Earth to the Sun. James Webb technicians have now successfully completed segment alignment and image stacking. The second and third of seven phases involved in aligning the observatory's primary mirror. They first needed to activate the telescope's fine guidance sensor. That allowed them to lock onto a guide star and keep the telescope pointed towards that star with a high degree of accuracy. The star they chose was HD 84406, a bright isolated star in the constellation Ursa Major. To stay locked onto the celestial target, the fine guidance sensor measures the exact position of the guide star in its field of view 16 times per second and then sends adjustments to the telescope's fine steering mirror about 3 times per second. The light from that single guide star was received by the 18 separate mirrors which make up the individual golden hexagonal segments of the telescope's primary mirror. Once the technicians had the 18 separate images, they began the segment alignment phase, which corrects most of the large positioning errors in the mirror segments. 
This involved defocusing the segment images by moving the secondary mirror slightly. Mathematical analysis called phase retrieval is applied to the defocused images to determine the precise positioning errors of the segments. The adjustment of the segments then results in, well, I guess you'd call them 18 well-corrected telescopes. However, these 18 hexagonal segments still aren't working together as a single mirror. Lee Feinberg from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, is the James Webb Space Telescope's optical telescope element manager. Well, first of all, the first evaluation images came in in the middle of the night, but the team all came in and um, we gathered and we evaluated whether the, the camera was working well enough for us to proceed on with the alignment. And uh, as we analyzed those first, uh, you know, photons, if you will, um, the team was pretty positive that the camera was working properly and the instrument was working properly. So we, we picked a star that was very bright and didn't have any stars near it that would contaminate the image. We know that the primary mirror segments aren't aligned, so they actually act like 18 separate telescopes. And we expect to see 18 separate images, one for each mirror, that are a little bit blurry at this point because we haven't aligned or focused anything. And so we pointed at a bright star and we made a mosaic. We actually took the near-infrared camera and we took images in different parts of the sky. And then we looked for the 18 spots from the 18 different telescopes, if you will. And we were very excited to find them. And the 18 spots were actually fairly close to each other. So really everything was very close to what was predicted. We've identified which of the 18 spots is which mirror. At this point, we even know which ones are from the wings. And uh, it turns out one of the wings, you can actually see those three spots are a little farther over. And, and that's sort of what we expected. So we've identified all 18 spots and uh, the next step is to make an array of them. And then we're ready to start uh, what we call global alignment, which is when each of those 18 spots will start to be aligned and focused. And that's sort of the, the last step before we take those 18 spots and put them on top of each other to start forming a single star going through the 18 separate telescopes. We also took a, a selfie of the primary mirror. We took an image of the primary mirror, and that helps us understand the alignment of the telescope, especially the primary mirror, to the, the camera itself and the instruments. There's actually a special lens in the near-infrared camera that you can put in, and it allows you to take a, a picture of the primary mirror itself and in this particular case, one of the segments is pointing at a star. So that is the segment that lights up. But you can see the outline through the shadows of all 18 segments. And you also can see the outline of what's inside of the instrument itself. And we can see how well that primary mirror and the telescope is aligned to the instrument. And that gives us some initial confidence that the alignment looks good. And that's a good starting point for doing the alignment of the telescope. We have now gotten some data looking through focus, and we've been able to see that we don't see any surprises in the shapes of the mirrors that we're looking at. So, so far so good, but we do have a long way to go. That's Lee Feinberg from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. To put all the light from these 18 mirrors into a single place, each segment image had to be stacked on top of one another. In this image stacking phase, scientists move the individual segment images so they all fall precisely at the center of the field of view to produce one unified image. So the focus dots reflected by each mirror were literally stacked on top of each other to produce a single image on the telescope's secondary mirror, delivering photons of light from each segment to exactly the same spot. During image stacking, scientists activated a series of six mirrors at a time, getting them to refocus their photons until all the dots of starlight overlapped. While image stacking placed the light of the guide star into one place, the mirror segments are still acting like 18 small telescopes rather than one single big one. And this is where the fourth phase of mirror alignment, called coarse phasing, comes in. It'll involve all these segments lining up with each other by correcting vertical displacement between the mirror segments. This will make this single dot of starlight that they've now achieved progressively sharper and sharper and more focused. Ultimately, James Webb will allow scientists to see much further back in space-time than the Hubble Space Telescope. It'll look back more than 13.4 billion years to the birth of the very first stars and galaxies. But it'll do more than that. 
Astrobiologist Gita Arne from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center says James Webb will also allow scientists to study the atmosphere of distant worlds, searching for signs of life. I'm really excited to use the James Webb Space Telescope to look for signs of life in the atmospheres of potentially habitable planets. And in particular, we're searching for signatures called biosignatures, which are remotely observable signs of life. Now on Earth, some of the important biosignatures of our own planet are oxygen, which is produced by oxygenic photosynthesis that, of course, we all know plants do that. Um, there's all sorts of microbes that also do oxygenic photosynthesis. And a lot of people consider it the dominant metabolism of our planet. Another important biosignature of Earth is methane. A methane on our planet is produced by microbes that live in a variety of places, ranging from hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean to the guts of cows. And they produce most of the methane that's in our planet's atmosphere. So these are important gases that we want to look for in the atmospheres of exoplanets with the James Webb Space Telescope. But you also have to really carefully interpret that gas. That is, does it make sense for life to produce that given biosignature in that given environment? And then, really importantly, you also want to rule out what are called biosignature false positives. Uh, biosignature false positives are non-life ways that a planet can fool you by producing, you know, something that looks like a biosignature, but it's not actually a biosignature because it's not produced by life. It's produced by some other process like volcanism or atmospheric chemistry or, you know, any other process that doesn't involve life. So all of this together means this is a really exciting search, but it's going to be complicated. And if we detect something that we think is a biosignature when we look at an exoplanet, it might not immediately be definitive. It might be ambiguous until we collect more data to better understand it in the context of its environment. That's Gita Arne from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And this is Space Time. Still to come. A whole bunch of new science experiments reached the International Space Station, and later in the science report, new research debunks previous assumptions that the mental speed of humans peaks at age 20. So I guess there's hope for me yet. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A Northrop Grumman Cygnus cargo ship carrying 3.8 tons of supplies has successfully docked with the International Space Station. The Cygnus was grabbed by the space station's robotic arm and manoeuvred into position to attach to the Unity module's Earth-facing port one and a half days after launching aboard a Northrop Grumman Antares rocket from NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginian Mid-Atlantic coast. This is Mission Control Houston Launch Pad 0A at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport on Wallops Island, Virginia. Northrop Grumman's Antares rocket poised on top of the pad, towering 130 33 feet tall, fully fueled, ready to launch over 8,000 pounds of research, fresh food, technology demonstrations, and supplies to the International Space Station. This is Northrop Grumman's CRS-17 mission, and liftoff is set for 11.40 and 3 seconds a.m. Central Time, 12.40 and 3 seconds p.m. Eastern Time at the start of a five-minute launch window today. The first stage is already loaded with its fuel to launch into space, liquid oxygen, and RP-1 kerosene. The second stage of Antares is a solid rocket motor. LC Prop 2. HSSASD is paused. The weather conditions for today's launch are looking good. It's currently 45 degrees and partly cloudy with winds at about 18 miles per hour. Teams all across the United States are supporting today's NG-17 launch. At the Wallops Flight Facility in Wallops, Virginia, Northrop Grumman engineers are monitoring today's countdown from the Range Control Center. Everything is currently a go for launch. Teams in Mission Control Houston are also monitoring the operation of the space station and watching today's launch. The flight director during this Orbit 2 shift is Judd Freeling. Stage 1, LC, countdown 1. Go ahead, LC. 
Yeah, provide status of cold helium bottle supply pressure. Yeah, we're still monitoring LC. Uh, we'll make a call between now and L minus 16 minutes. There are currently seven human beings living and working aboard the International Space Station as part of Expedition 66. They are NASA astronaut Raja Chari and Tom Marshburn, European Space Agency astronaut Matthias Maurer, Roscosmos cosmonauts Anton Shkaplerov and Piotr Dubrov, and NASA astronauts Caleb Barron and Mark Vandehei. Vandehei is in the midst of a record-breaking space flight in which he will become the American with the longest single space flight. On March 15th, he'll break Scott Kelly's record of 340 days in space. When Vandehei returns to Earth on March 30th, he will have spent a record-breaking 355 consecutive days in orbit. It is a tradition for each Cygnus vehicle to be named after a significant space explorer who contributed to human space exploration. Today's Cygnus being launched is named the SS Piers Sellers after late NASA astronaut and climate scientist Pierre Sellers. Pierre Sellers began his career at NASA in 1982 and flew three times on the space shuttle aboard STS-112, STS-121, and STS-132. In total, Pierre Sellers spent nearly 35 days in space, and as an astronaut, he helped build the International Space Station over the course of six spacewalks totaling 41 hours. This Cygnus mission is unique in that it has reboost capability. In addition to delivering more than the 8,000 pounds of critical cargo to the astronauts living on the ISS, uh, the Northrop Grumman Cygnus spacecraft will perform its first operational ISS reboost. Reboosting is a critical part of altitude maintenance for the International Space Station. What happens is the Earth's atmosphere causes a slight amount of drag, causing the uh, station orbit to decay over time. So Northrop Grumman will perform the adjustment service while Cygnus is actually actually birthed with the station. So small, precise nudges are required to place the ISS back into its proper orbit. And Northrop Grumman is very proud to offer the standard service to NASA. Range is green. Copy, range green. Copy, uh, priming has been verified. Check 427 and 428. And launch team be advised, phase three dynamic limits will be active. Everything's still green across the board. Five, four, three, two, one. We have engine ignition. Yep. And uh, the entire launch vehicle from the launch flight facility is around 100% for us. And we have liftoff of the SS Piers Sellers carrying over 8,000 pounds of cargo to the International Space Station. Good performance on the first stage so far. Still have 100% thrust, nominal, or valve VNO3 open. Remains nominal. Electrical power is nominal. Everything continuing to look good on Antares. 25,000 feet from max Q. The first stage is now passing through max Q, the area of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket. Now 90 seconds into today's flight of the Northrop Grumman Cygnus resupply cargo craft headed to the International Space Station. NG3 now open. Engines remain steady at 100% thrust. 7,000 feet per second velocity. Attitude remains nominal. Continuing to get good reports from the range control center at Wallops. Okay, now 11,000 feet per second. Beginning slow throttle down. Pressures remain nominal. Throttle down will occur three minutes into the flight, which means main engine cutoff will be coming soon. And Miko. We have Miko or main engine cutoff, and Terry's now entering a coast stage. Fairing separation will occur about 30 seconds from now. Stage one delta V. Stage one is separated. There are some controlled firings of the inner stage of the rocket. Everything continuing to perform as expected. The vehicle remains at nominal at the fairing separation. Fairing separation confirms Cygnus now exposed to the atmosphere as it continues its trek uphill to its preliminary orbit. Stage two ignition. Stage two ignition confirmed. Stage two remains nominal. Stage two is a solid rocket motor burn for about two minutes and 44 seconds. TVC on is nominal. Power is nominal. TVC is nominal. Continuing to hear all good calls now four minutes into today's flight. 100 seconds to burnout. The equal attitude remains nominal. Stage 2 remains nominal. Stage 2 motor pressure starting to tail off. The equal attitude remains nominal. And we have stage 2 burnout. Stage 2 burnout confirmed. Cygnus has reached the preliminary orbital insertion. The next major event will be Cygnus separation from the second stage, which will occur at about the 8 minute 51 second mark. Everything still performing as expected, now 7 minutes into today's launch. Power and attitude remain nominal. Terry's remains nominal. And we have payload separation. Spacecraft separation confirmed. Cygnus now well on its way to the International Space Station. The mission was Northrop Grumman's 17th contracted resupply flight under NASA's second commercial resupply services contract. The Cygnus manifest included research equipment, crew supplies and hardware for the team aboard the orbiting outpost. This included equipment designed to study the effects of a drug on breast and prostate cancer cells, a new combustion facility, 
an investigation on skin ageing and microgravity, new hydrogen sensors to test the space station's oxygen generation system, new equipment to test hydroponic and aeroponic techniques for plant growth, a demonstration of a lithium-ion secondary battery capable of safe, stable operation under extreme temperatures and in a vacuum environment, and a small 6-kilogram nanosatellite called Nachos, which is equipped with a new prototype instrument designed to make it easier to monitor volcanic activity and air quality. This is Space Time. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 